Bismillah, Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. You're listening to Microbiology Lesson and today we're going to talk about microbial applications in industry. You've got two outcomes that you want to aim for. Number one, you should be able to explain the concept of industry and then how industry affects the society. And secondly, you can relate microbiology with industry through relevant examples of applications. To do that, we're going to go through three things. Firstly, and this is most crucial, we want to understand concepts associated with the industry and then how industry relates to what you are learning in microbiology. This is going to be the overarching framework where you place your examples in, right? So this is like the large map to navigate to where you're going when you study specific examples. And this is actually the education part of all of this, because once you've got this, you can just explore online and conduct your own research about different examples of microbial application in industry. Then after that, we're going to look closely at examples from two major industries, the health industry and the food industry. Obviously, these are not the only two. We just use them so that you can have a sort of a feeling of how microbiology is implemented in industry. And because our health matters and because what we eat matters, in this topic, you kind of also learn how microbiology affects you as a person indirectly as it is affecting these, these two industries. Now, at this point of your learning, you should be able to answer if people ask you what microbiology is. But what about industry? It's a good idea to clarify to yourself what you understand about a concept. It will help you make sense of the more complicated stuff down the line. It helps you to think clearly. So here's what I'm thinking about when I use the word industry. Industry is any economic activity that produces goods or services that benefit humanity and the environment. So I'm going to break it down. When we think about industry, at the very basic, I want you to think about the external dimension and the internal dimension of it. The external dimension is the materialistic component of the definition. So it's about economic activity, which means it's about allocating resources to generate wealth. It's a social interaction where we want to produce goods and services for ourselves and for others. That's the external dimension of it. It's so important. And from the secular worldview, that's enough. That is all you need to understand industry. But if you are like me, you want to also reflect on the internal religious aspect of the concept, right? What's the purpose of industry? To me, thinking about industry is thinking about what benefits humanity and what benefits the environment. So when you graduate, you want to give your expertise in microbiology to the right industry, to one that brings you and, and your clients and your employers closer to God rather than away from Him. And you might be surprised how difficult it is to do that in practice. I mean, there are obvious industries like alcohol industry that you can easily decide you don't want to work for. But when it comes to, say, food industry, when you get a job offer, you've got to ask yourself, what kind of food that this company is producing? Is it good for humanity that we eat this? Um, does it involve factory farming where animals are tortured? Or is it environmentally sustainable if we keep doing this? So essentially, you want to ask yourself, do I want to use my microbiology skills, my scientific knowledge to help um, perpetuate this business within this industry, right? So yeah, that's the practical dimension of learning all of this. Now, another aspect that characterizes an industry is its scalability. It must be scalable. Imagine you do an economic activity, but there are only three of you who produce and consume a service. Like you develop an app and just two of your friends buy it from you and use it. So that's hardly an industry. But when instead of just three people, you scale up your business 
and you've got 3,000 people involved in that economic activity. Now we're talking industry. Industry is also vary across time and geography. Why? Because of combinations of factors in terms of demography, technology, and philosophy. The demographic aspect is the um, composition of the population. If you've got more elderly people in your society than the industries, health industry, food industry, whatever, the makeup of those industries will be different than if the bulk of your society consists of children and young parents. So that's the first factor. Technology is another. So an industry, especially sophisticated ones like personalized medicine, for example, its market size is now already over a trillion dollars. But even if the market size has always been that gigantic, it still wouldn't have been possible for that industry to survive if we didn't have the genomic sequencing technology, right? So access to technology is a massive factor. And another factor is the philosophy. The maqasid, the higher purpose of a society, determines what sort of industries will flourish in that society. You can actually witness this yourself if you've got a chance to live in uh, two different countries for a period of time. I mean, if you don't have a chance yet, maybe talk to people who have lived in two different countries or just read about it online. So when you live in a society, think of an industry category, say digital technology or, or fashion or textile industry, or actually think of food industry because microbiology relates to food a lot. So compare the food industry in the two different countries where you have lived in. Think about which kind of food is easier to find, the healthy food or the high sugar oily food, right? Think about in which society it is easier to find, for example, vegan food or vegetarian options, or how, how big is the meal size, how big is the meal portions in those two different countries comparatively. So those differences in the availability of the products reflect the types of industry that flourish in that particular society. And that in turn reflects the philosophical and religious values that the society has. Not the value that they say they have, you see, but the value that they practice in daily life. Scholars of economy have identified four industrial revolutions. So if you are listening to this for my class, I will leave a link to one video which you can focus your study on. But if you're not listening to this to prepare for my exam, I would say seek as many videos as you want out there on industrial revolutions. It's so important. It's important for you to be aware of it because it's going to affect your career and your life one way or another. But briefly, you have four revolutions and we are, according to scholars, live in the fourth industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution is mechanization. It is brought about by uh, steam power technology, where we can convert heat energy into mechanical energy. The second one is the establishment of mass production. The technology that precipitated this is arguably electricity. We discovered electricity and apply it to factories, assembly lines. The third industrial revolution is automation. So this is the digital revolution where we invented computers and eventually gave rise to the internet. The fourth industrial revolution is the merging of technologies, the combination of digital, physical, and biological technologies. What separates it from the previous industrial revolutions is not just the merging itself, rather it's about the velocity, the about how fast they merge and how, how systemic the impacts have been on our lives. Imagine how it's like in, for instance, the fourth industrial revolution in the, in the healthcare industry. So you're not feeling well, you see a doctor. Uh, then the doctor uses a biosensor device that she straps on your wrist. 
then the device transmits your bio readings to the doctor's phone or, or tablet. Then um, that's got synchronized with the servers of a centralized system, like a national medical database or something. And then, and then the database can network with other uh, social databases that belong to large entities like Google, Facebook, or Microsoft. Um, that network has a software that can cross-analyze your information from your social media and, and, and your other accounts. So they, they get your gender, your age, where you have been traveling for the last two, two weeks, your close contacts, um, perhaps even your genomic data. Then this merged system can generate a chart of probable diagnosis, what type of infection that you might be having. Then that chart can be sent to a computer for the microbiology team at the hospital's diagnostics lab. So that will help the microbiologist to narrow down what you've probably got infected with. And then they can run a biochemical test to confirm it. Then the test result goes back into the doctor's tablet and then she can treat you. So it's something like that. So that's the kind of world that they are painting for us. Not everything about it is good though, but you know we can talk about that at another time. Yeah, that's industrial revolution. Now, if you decide to stay in the microbiology related field for your future career, you can be an active part of that fourth industrial revolution. And most likely you're going to be part of a multidisciplinary project or corporation. And you're going to be on the biotechnology side of things. Um, biotechnology is the application of biological processes to serve a purpose. And included in that are biological processes that involve microorganisms. And it's not necessarily the microorganisms themselves. It can also include the uh, metabolites, the biological substances that the microbes produce. And through scalability, the concept that I mentioned before, industries can reduce the cost per unit for these metabolites by using large scale bioreactors for instance. There are many examples where we use microorganisms in industry. Aspergillus, for instance, can produce cellulase that can be applied as denim finishing agent in textile industry. Saccharomyces produces ethanol that can be used as a gasoline additive for energy industry, which helps increasing its performance and, and quality. And not just as additive, Microorganisms like certain types of microalgal strain, they can secrete lipids that can be converted to biodiesel. We can actually get an order of magnitude more volume of biofuel with algae than with many other resources like soy, corn, sugar cane, and palm oil. So in other words, you get way more fuel per unit of land that you use to grow them. Hmm. Although, personally, I would still invest more in solar technology because it's going to be cleaner for the environment than burning biofuel, at least as far as I understand it. Sometimes, um, um, this reminds me what I mentioned before in the beginning about our internal, our spiritual relationship with industry. Let's say you, you become a microbiologist who have a PhD in microbial biofuel technology. You're going to want biofuel to gain dominance in the energy market share because you'll get personal benefit. You know, it's reasonable to feel that way. And then maybe one day you meet someone on LinkedIn and, and she's a CEO of an energy company. So you have a meeting with her. She's consulting you because her board of directors want to venture into renewable energy segments of the market. And she's asking you, is it better to use microbial fuel or is it better to use solar technology? If it's better to use their biofuel, then they want to hire you as a long-term consultant. So there, in that situation, you have to struggle with your own nafs, with your own ego about presenting the solar option fairly. Even if that means it's going to set your career back, even if that means you might lose an opportunity for yourself 
to get that consulting contract and earn lots of money to take care of your family. You see, it won't be easy. So, so how you handle that kind of situations in your career later depends more on your relationship with God than with your scientific understanding. Another example of microbial biotech is um, using microorganisms like theobacillus for metal extractions from ores. I think it's copper. You, you can go and double check that. It's a whole engineering field called biohydrometallurgy. You can search keywords like biomining and what else? Bioleaching. So go and read about them. They're quite interesting. I think my cousin told me once that some bacteria can even extract gold as well. Yeah, I just gave you those three examples for you to understand and remember for this particular subtopic. But for lifelong learning, you can explore more examples out there. There are loads of other cool examples that I haven't mentioned. Like, for instance, we can encode computer data into bacterial DNA. They did that by converting the binary codes into nucleic acid sequences, probably using CRISPR-Cas9 system. I can't remember how they did it. So in the near future, you can have a biologically based computer instead of silicon based computer. So it's like in Star Trek where you've got biological ships with DNA based computers on board. And I'm sure you have seen something like that floating around in other sci-fi shows or, or video games as well. Um, let me know in the comment or in our forum if you have other examples, because maybe I can share that with other students in the future. Um, all right, I'm going to stop here for now. I will continue in the next episode. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.